happy to be here again in Tallinn. It's always great to be here. Unfortunately, I don't speak Estonian, so please put your headphones on, but otherwise you might not understand me. So, my name is Marco Scalo. I'm a, a trained architect and civil engineer from the University of Delft. I'm currently living in the Stockholm archipelago with my wife and five children. So, I'm a busy man with five children, as you can imagine. The smallest one is four months. That's a lot of work. The oldest one is 19. Sometimes a lot of work as well, I tell you, even if it shouldn't be. So that's my background. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've been work, working with something that I now call integrated design. Well, as an architect and civil engineer, I have for a couple of years worked as an end customer, purchasing and building over 100 buildings, looking at all the aspects of financial aspects, technical aspects, legal aspects, and so on. Then I have roughly 10 years worked uh, for a producer, looking at the same thing from the other side. And now the last one and a half years, I'm, I'm doing this uh, full time basically to work with the integration of the process. Because what I realized is that, uh, also what Marie-Elise was saying, also what, uh, uh, what um, Professor Kornitsky was saying, is uh, a lot of the technology we have is in place. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. But the working methods to get there, the integration of the process, the timelines that you showed very efficiently, there's a lot of things to win, a lot of things to earn. And also there's a lot of money to save that way, or extra gains to make, to make it more profitable to be sustainable. So in the beginning we look at the architecture. So it's, it's a very nice idea that you have this energy consultant sitting in from the beginning, but really sometimes it feels like the architectural design and the technical design, they are like against each other almost. The architect doesn't like installations, he wants to hide them all. He doesn't like to see anything, because a clean ceiling, voids of light and so on. This is the typical architect approach. Uh, we use natural ventilation, we'll just be fine. Right? You have heard that before? Okay, be scared. Or, the other option would be, the HVAC design comes in eventually, later. Once the architect is done with this concept and basic layout and construction, then someone calls somebody like a contractor and they will try to get some offers for some machines, some air handling units, whatever. And they realize, oh, maybe we should have thought of some things before. This riser will take quite a lot of space. Which rooms are we sacrificing? How high will the ceiling be if we have to lower it because the ducts get bigger or whatever? Okay, maybe a bit late. Or should it actually be an integration from the start? Concept, location, the aesthetics, and the technical design from day one. And today, after this lecture, I'm arguing for this is the way we maybe should work forward. And this is the way we maybe get the best success and the most sustainability in the whole thing. So, the main questions for today. Effect of architectural typology. You showed those million program houses in Sweden. What's the effect of that? The comfort, the running costs, what does it mean for the environment? How many of such buildings do we have? What happens if you have very strong architecture and very weak installations, or the other way around? What happens if both are weak or both are strong? I give you some examples. How much space do you actually need to be efficient with your installations in the building? And is that the same for all the buildings, or is that different from building type to building type? back to that. And of course, last but not least, how sustainable uh, can it be when you have an economic, an economical and environmental advantage at the same time? Is that possible? Is it so that uh, sustainability will always cost more money? Or will it actually save you money? I will try something here. If we look at really this term what we call net zero energy building, and we divide this into cost spending and cost saving, or maybe even something we call profit. <coughs> if we construct the building, you think it will be more expensive or cheaper if you go for net zero energy? What do you think? More expensive. More expensive. Okay, we put it here. Okay. If we go for the energy consumption, the running cost of the building, will it be more expensive or cheaper? Cheaper, okay, thank you. Now, if we last but not least go for the 
perfect indoor climate. Or as you call it, the, uh, the what is it, the short deprivation, IEQ, whatever. The indoor quality. Indoor quality. quality. Will that increase or decrease the cost or the profit, really? You will put it on cost spending, right? It's more expensive. Now, what normally will happen, if things get more expensive for you, or for the people that build, you have to have paragraphs, legal, I, you must do this, you, you must have a minimum requirement, and so on. But, if something is good for you, you will do it anyway. So, I hope after this lecture today, we might be able to move some of these points to the other side. And then maybe legal requirements are not that important anymore. Let's find out. Can we try, together? So, and that's of course as well the advantages of the early integration that we're talking about. This concept of integrated design, just to start off with what I mean by that, definition. It combines the concept and the architecture of a building with all the technical stages of a building, from the very beginning. This also means that the architect and installation consultant should work together from the very beginning. So this is not just what happens, but when it happens. And this of course means that all the materials, the shapes, the sizes, it all has to be related to the building type, the climate, the legislation in Estonia is slightly different than in Sweden or in Germany or Holland, and of course the special requirements of this very building, if there's any such things. So, if we look for the building, of course, it could have to do with the thermal mass of the building. It could be to do with what's, what's the functionality that Marilee sees. And of course, if you have a factory, different things will happen than in a home. You will have certain energy uses that you will not have in a home, but you will have them in a the factory and so on. And you have to take that into account. I think what's important for me when we talk about sustainability, we sometimes confuse that we mean environmentally friendly. That's not really true. That's one part of the three that makes something sustainable. It's not enough it's net zero energy. It doesn't automatically mean it's sustainable. It also has to fit to the societal context we are in, here and now. You actually have to use the building the way you want to use it. It shouldn't limit you. It has to be part of your everyday work life. And of course it has to be economically feasible, like Marley said before. If it costs a lot of money and we have to support it with subsidiaries from the government and so on and so forth, how sustainable is that really? Yes, you can start a technical development by subsidies, but in the long run, if it's too expensive, it's not really sustainable. So that is why I think it's important to remember that there's three parts that create sustainability. If we look at integrated design for buildings, we could say we reduce energy, if we go back to the energy, in three steps. Step number one would be the building shell. Well, if you look at this building, of course it's important. Is it wood? Is it concrete? How many windows do you have? Do you have what kind of glass do you use? What solar shading do you have? All of these things will affect how much energy this building will actually use. So it's the material, it's the orientation of the building, it's the amount of windows that we had before as well, what kind of U values and G values you have, how tight is the building, solar shading, etc., etc. And now, of course, the quality of every of these aspects matters. I give you one example, glass. When we discuss glass, I very often see U values. Now, this is very conservative, 1.3. I've seen below 1, most of you had in your presentations. But Quite often, U values will be around 1.1, 1.2 in many commercial buildings. Well, that's, that's great for the winter time. How interesting is the U value for summertime? Anybody of you know? Any idea? Is it important for good U value for glass in the summertime? No. Okay. So what's important in the summertime? I'm sure you said G value solar shading factor, right? Is that what you said? I don't speak Estonian, so I think so. So 0.4, that value is much more intuitively easy to understand than the U value, because it means 0.4 that maximum 40% of the solar energy or solar heating gets into the building. 60% stay outside. 
That's interesting. And that's what we call low energy glass also. And if, you can, if we can do that, the architects will also be more happy because if there's one thing I don't like, it's solar shading. Now, what we've seen in many of the situations now with solar shading, you see that you get those static uh, horizontal solar shadings above windows, right? Uh, because it's the only solar shading architects could possibly consider to be included. When you think the uh, cooling load of a building is the highest during the year, any idea? What, what uh, date in the year? Suggestions, please. When you need most cooling in your building? Come on, don't be so shy. Work with me here. Spring. It's spring? Anybody else? Winter, maybe? Summer? Autumn? August. August, you say? Spring, you said? Anything else? It's quite interesting. I work a lot with Equi. Maybe you know Equi. <laughs> it's uh, Equi, a company in Stockholm for energy simulation. They have a program called ESPO that they do together with the university and, uh, and so on. And if you run these calculations, you will see, in Tallinn also, you're onto something there. In spring and autumn, normally the uh, cooling load will be much higher than in July. Why is that, you think? Yes, thank you. So, when we go to glass at all costs, we come to this window part and this uh, slow sun. These pictures you probably have seen before. This because this happened actually in Estonia, Estonian workplace. And the Paul showed me this one. Now, that's great with a lot of windows, but maybe not. So, what about glass and what's the right glass? So, of course, you have to find the right balance. You have this one where all the solar shades are down. Or you have this one, no windows at all. Maybe that's to overdo it. Actually, this is, you know what this is? This is the Federal Reserve in New York, where they keep all the money. That's why they don't like windows, because it's easier not to get in. Um, but of course, if you have the right level of glass, here we are about these solar angles, what we're into. The sun is penetrating the building much deeper in September and March than in the summer. So all this lovely solar shading that sits up here, only does good in summertime. So August and July is eliminated, but then the sun goes lower, and in the springtime, when you actually need more cooling, the solar shining is not doing anything, else, or very little. So this is quite interesting. And this is, of course, true for June and September, but it's also true for another situation. And we always think we are so unique in Stockholm, in Tallinn, in wherever, uh, Munich, uh, we're not really. If you look at the standard office, single office room in Tallinn, and let's say you have an installed cooling power of 927 watt, I calculated that in the program, as an example. How much do you think will be the cooling power needed in Lisbon for the same room, with the same orientation, with the same U-value, same glass? <coughs> Any suggestion? How many percentage difference? 50. 50%? 50. 15%, okay. Anything else? Fine. 5%? Anybody thinks much more, much less? No? Okay. It's almost the same. So you're onto something. Again, why is that? It's the same reason. Now, if we look at the solar angle in Tallinn and Lisbon, yes, of course. If you see here in summertime and in wintertime, you see it's 51 in Lisbon, it's 30 in Tallinn. It's 74 in Lisbon, it's 53 in the middle of summer. So the sun will always sit lower in Tallinn than in Lisbon. So the cooling uh, need in Tallinn will be bigger or basically the same because of course Lisbon is warmer and it's more sun, but that's almost taking out the effect <coughs> by the solar angle. So if the, if the building would be the same, it would be the same requirement in Tallinn and Lisbon. That's quite nice. So we can all play by the same rules. That's good, that helps. If we talk about net zero energy buildings. But it's also good for you how to should think of solar shading, and that's why it's interesting to have the right plus. Now, of course, we have to find the right solution in the right spot. I love solar panels, but anybody thinks what's wrong with this picture? I'm looking to the south, and I'm seeing the solar panels on the north side, obviously, of the building, and it's still the sun on the solar panels. Somebody is really good with Photoshop, but I wonder how much energy do they get from those solar panels? And so you can most of huh? I'm not sure that picture is real. <laughs> I found it, but it's, it's in a solar brochure how great it is with solar panels. But I have a hard time to see those two things at the same time. So if you make, there is no small engineering mistakes. Have you seen a small engineering mistake? The perfect bridge could look like this. 
you're in trouble. There's no small mistakes, okay? This doesn't work. Well, integrated design, next step. We go from the building shell, we go to the room level. Now, on the room level, the most important thing is that what happens in the room will change during time, during the day. What is the activity going on in that room? And we have to adapt to that, especially on the installation level. So, of course, the choice of lighting is important, at least as long as the lights are on. So we talk about LED before, for instance. But it's also interesting to talk about absence control. So if nobody's in the room, what happens? They made studies on classrooms where they see as soon as the classrooms are empty, automatically the lights will shut off. That will save a lot of percentage of energy per year. Because people will forget to hit the light switch when they go out. But as soon as people get into the room, the lights go on again. That's quite good. But it also means for, my, for installations that you do, you do not want to over-ventilate. Now, if you have this room, it's a good seminar today. You're all here, great. A few empty chairs. But imagine there's only 10 of you here. Do we need the same rate of ventilation in this room? Absolutely not. Because you, you all emit CO2, you all emit heat. Now, if this room would only be controlled on presence detection, as soon as one person is in here, you have full blast, and if you all are here, this is still the same. So that is not demand control ventilation for me, it's just present detection. So you have to go for the right values, you have to go for temperature, CO2 levels, and of course present detection. So do not overventilate. Do not underpool. What is the set point? How much do you need to cool the roof? What's the, good, the perfect temperature in here? Do not overheat. When does this room have to be heated and how much? So it's demand control climate distribution will be a key of reducing energy a lot. And what you've seen also in those uh, pictures from before, the ventilation part of things will be one of the big factors that will reduce the amount of energy used in the building. Here there's a lot of things to do with a relatively small cost if you compare that with changing a whole facade, for instance, <coughs> which is extremely expensive, new walls, new windows, all of this. This is a lot of money if you talk about existing buildings. So the control matters. So here, the occupancy would be demand control on temperature, air quality, and lights, of course. And the absence, you have the reduced air volume, the lower heating, and the higher cooling set points. You don't cool a room that's empty because nobody will talk about the climate or the comfort. Nobody's there. Now, if we go back to the architects, this is quite interesting again. Um, if you think of this room, anybody thought of the climate in this room? Have you? Anybody thought of the sound that you hear? You thought of that, right? Okay. Are you freezing? No. Are you sweating? No, it's okay. So basically, the good indoor climate, when it's perfect, it becomes invisible. If something is wrong, you think of it. Now that's interesting. If you go to an architect and say, well, you have designed this beautiful room, fantastic architecture, and people sitting in there, they're freezing or they're listening to this, will they actually enjoy your architecture or will they be pissed off and angry because something is cold or warm or noisy or something? So you, dear architect, have a big interest in having the perfect indoor climate because then people will actually like your building. And you want to be liked, right? You're an architect. We all have big egos. Yes, of course. We want to be liked. So. We like perfect indoor climates if we know what we're doing. Next part. If we look at the central level, of course, that's the next step where we save energy. It's, of course, the energy recovery we talk about. Uh, we talk about plate exchanges, about rotary exchanges, but we can also talk about the energy recovery of the temperatures and energies around us. And that's why I'm very often getting into both chillers and heat pumps. We say we actually we use the outdoor air or we use a ground source to, to get heating or cooling into a building without having to produce too much and without having to transport energy too far. So, of course, we can always argue how clean or dirty is electrical energy. Absolutely. And we go into district heating in Sweden, that's the most favored of everything, is district heating is always the solution to all the environmentally friendly buildings, but it's not. If we go to 
A city like Malmö, district heating is created by diesel generators. That's so environmentally friendly, right? Nope. I would go for a heat pump each and every time. I go to the city of Halmstad. All the district heating is regenerated by the burning of the waste of the city. Well, of course, that energy is there anyway. It's for free. I don't care how much energy you lose on the way because this energy would just be lost otherwise. Then I say, yes, thank you, district heating is a good solution. So it's not that easy. How do you value that? But of course, if you then go to a heat pump situation, you also have to think, okay, how do you produce the electricity? Is that like water, like in Norway, or atomic power, like in France, or just coal, like in Estonia? Of course, that's a very important issue. But of course, in a heat pump, I put in one kilowatt of energy, I get out four or five kilowatt of energy. That's quite a substantial saving I can make of how much I have to pay for heating my building. So that's something I have to consider as well. Balanced air volume, extremely important. In Estonia, maybe you use to balance air volume, or maybe not. Even in countries like Sweden, you say, yes, we have always balanced air volume. But then I ask my lady, say, well, what about those million houses that all go on extract air regulation? Is that balanced? Uh, no. Okay, so we're not always used on balanced air volume. If, you go, if I go to the UK, what they say, no, 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 we have to over-pressurize the building because we have to be sure that nothing bad can come inside. So minimum 15, 20% over-pressure is still a standard in commercial buildings in the UK. Well, what that means, 15, 20% of the energy you put into the building are pushed right out, so you're heating all of London, you're cooling all of London, you're ventilating all of London, at least for 20% of the building. What it also means, you press moisture into the construction. So the Accor Hotel Group, you know Accor, Ibis and Mercure and Novotel, they, they, they had to renovate over 5,000 hotel rooms that were operating in overpressure. You're in there, you're showering, you put a lot, of, a lot of moist, and all this moist was pressed into the construction. What do you think happens? Fungus, mold, smell, not really five star, not four, not three, not even one star. You don't want to live there, you have to close it down. So balanced ventilation is quite interesting. And of course, you have to dimension the energy carriers the right way. I mean, even su the suppliers often forget that. You can have the most beautiful machines all around the building. If you don't have the right ducts, the right pipe work, the, like, the right electric connections, and the right controls, you can destroy it all very easily. This was where this whole integration comes into place again, how to integrate everything also within the installations. Otherwise, it will not work properly. And of course, it's all about reducing the primary energy, the pur pur purchased energy, or the delivered energy, as, uh, as Yarek called it. And efficiency matters. So you have on the, on, the air, on the air handling units, you have the heating, cooling, and humidity recovery as much as possible. Also in Estonia, in winter time, you actually want to recover to keep the humidity indoors, to have a better indoor climate, so things don't get static when you touch them. And Air goes very dry, people get asthma, and all people. so you want to keep the humidity indoors. And in summer, you want to keep the humidity outdoors. And of course, a low pressure you want to have. And if you talk about chillers and heat pumps, of course you want to be as efficient as possible, high COP, high EER, as we call it. So if we summarize these three points, the building shell, of course, has to be of high quality. The energy distribution, with air or water or gas, whatever you want, has to be demand controlled. And the production of heating, cooling, ventilation has to be done with the maximum efficiency and the maximum energy recovery. And of course, what's very, very important when you control the media, and this is something I, if you remember, if you remember something about HVAC from this lecture, please remember this. If you control media, always first use the fans and then the dampers. Always first use the pumps than the valves. What this means, you always want to have as low pressures in your system as possible. Because every pressure you produce will cost you money. Yeah, so if you want to have less air volume, and you close a damper, what will happen? The fans will have to work harder to do the little air left, right? While if you slow down the fan, the duct suddenly feels bigger. The air will move very lightly. And it will go down a lot in energy. This is exactly the same with uh, with pumps and uh, valves. Instead of closing all the valve, the thermostatic valves on the radiators, 
they actually made tests in Chalmers where they put small pumps on every radiator where they actually enable the flow more or less and they have an open system instead of closing the system when you need less heat. I think it was 18 or 20 percent more efficient. Quite interesting. So, integrated design. To give you some example of strong or weak architecture with strong or weak installations. And if we look at one part as the architecture, the concept, the shell, the building mass, and the other part is the installations. Could be HVAC, could be lights, it could be an overlet. The overlap here would be what we call integrated design. And that again from the very beginning. Those two circles symbolize that. Now we take an example of weak architecture and weak, weak HVAC. See, those circles don't even touch. Now, where could this be? France. This could be in France, this could be in uh, Tallinn, this could be in Stockholm, this could be in London. This is, actually, this is France, it's correct. This is some of the uh, Paris suburbs. But, but we've all seen these buildings all over the place because we've built them in all our countries in the 70s and 80s, right? Now, Either we have no HVAC at all, or it's very limited. We have an issue with smells and looking maybe quite bad. And not so much comfort to talk about. And of course you have high energy consumption, high running costs. And in the long term you have this problem with mold and fungus and smells and all of that comes with that. So, if we look at exactly what happens, you often have these beautiful concrete constructions that go right through to a loft or a balcony. What happens here, do you think? Well, we call them thermal bridges. What do thermal bridges do besides costing energy? They get condensation. What does condensation do? It creates fungus and mold. Exactly there, you see them. And that leads them to asthma, eczema, allergies, all <coughs> what we call sick buildings. And of course, we have the supply drills sometimes behind the, above the windows. Often they're just closed off because they create draft. And then you get humidity that stays in the apartments, and then you can start to drawing stuff in your apartment. Maybe not so nice. So if we look at this also, if we have this extract air ventilation, and the, what's the difference with that? If you would go to balance, maybe you have a fan, often you have a fan in the bathroom somewhere, or a central fan, and then you take in the air through the windows and doors. Well, you also take in all the sound from the traffic, because of course all these buildings are in heavily populated areas. You also take in the smells, your neighbor smoking on the balcony or barbecuing or whatever. And of course, it's drafty. And the draft can actually be quite good. I've actually, we've looked at new apartment buildings in Stockholm. They still build extract air ventilation, completely new built apartments. And they have a perfect indoor climate because they've done a lot of things. As long as it's winter time, you see? This radiator is warm. And the outdoor intake is behind the radiator. Very smart. You don't get draft from the outdoor air. But what happens in spring and autumn? It's not so cold. You don't have to have the radiator anymore. The floor is going ice cold. It just flows down and lays on the floor. And I've been in those apartments, and it's really terrible to be there in March or November or something. And you have small children wanting to play on the floor. And they all, you see, they all have socks on, and they all are like quite well dressed because they're freezing. So that's the problem with the extract ventilation. If we now look on the financial side of it, and we compare, this is almost the same numbers I saw from before. I, I recognize the numbers. This is the building with extra ventilation, 65 square meter, one apartment per year. It takes 12,000, almost 30,000 kilowatt hours. With balanced ventilation, the whole energy I need is 4,300. Because of the recovery, I use recovery uh, heat exchanger 80-85%. And actually, I put in the Estonian money for electricity, I was told. This is about what you pay in Estonia for the kilowatt of electricity to make these numbers interesting for you. And if I look for a whole apartment block of 100 apartments, I see that the annual saving will be 72,000 euros. So that's, that's quite substantial, or actually two-thirds reduction of energy per apartment. That's nice. So that, that's, uh, it actually it saves you a lot of money. And then, of course, we can argue what's the payback time for such a change. And we understand this, this goes quicker than if we do other things. Now, next example. We have beautiful architecture, 
but no or limited or hidden HVAC that is not fully integrated yet. And that's actually the initial design of a very praised building, the Swiss Re in London. It was a great idea of Norman Foster Architects of natural ventilation through big atriums. They thought this would just be magnificent, and theoretically it was great. And it looked fantastic. But they had an issue that these floors, of course, they're occupied differently by different companies at different times. And actually, they had got some trouble right, they run into. And I show you the trouble. These are the <coughs> atriums where this natural ventilation should move. And they realized, okay, to sustain that, on top of that, we're going to need big central air handling units that we put on each floor. That's what they did. Now imagine you're in central London, the most expensive square foot or square meter in the world, basically, not really, but in London at least, Bank Street. This is one bank, top floor. This is another bank, top floor. These atriums have to be open to work at national ventilation. Do you think that this bank wants to hear what this bank has to say about their finances? Absolutely they want to do. As soon as they move in, they close all these atriums off because you can't listen to your competition next floor for free, right? At least you have to put some bungs or something in there. So the natural, the natural ventilation of these atriums didn't work because they've all closed off because it's all different companies working on competing projects. <laughs> so in theory that was great, but in practice it didn't work. So the solution that was found, we increased the ventilation, we increased the smartness of this whole double facade idea that they had, and what happened is the new solution was these central small air handling units that were hidden in the roof that could supply each of these parts individually demand control. So there could be one demand here, another demand here. People could move around, this could be different companies, and they all would get the amount of energy they need and the amount of ventilation they need. Much more interesting. Also what happens is uh, you have uh, you, what have happened, you freed this space. Now, of course, you made the installation for HVAC much more expensive. Does it mean it becomes more expensive? Really? <coughs> think again, because if you think of the, the eye of the investor when he saw what happened, it didn't matter how much more the HVAC would cost anyway. It could cost three times the money than before. They didn't care. You know why? The core they freed <laughs> gave them a 12 million extra in rental intake over the 15 years. This is so much more money than the installations ever cost. I mean, imagine, again, center of London, now this is coffee machines, copy machines, all of these things, like storage, all of this that these companies actually are willing to pay a lot of money for to have on their own floor. So sometimes the cheapest solution on the technical side is much more expensive than a clever solution. So actually we can find a lot of money by integrating the design and looking, okay, it's not just the cost, actually what is the profits you can make in this situation. That gives you a completely different idea of how to pay for a near zero energy building. Another example, weak architecture and extremely strong technicals. What are you thinking about? This, is, this would be the most terrible building if it not would be the first of its kind. Because if it's the first of its kind, everybody loves it. But thinking about Centre Pompidou, of course. <laughs> would you like to live in this building? No. Is there a problem that people don't like it because they will empty it? No, because it's iconic. Because everybody, uh, this is, this is uh, like a museum. This is unique. But if you would build like this all the time, it would be quite ugly, right? And of course, you would have problems with renting this place out, it probably would be empty, you wouldn't get your, your rents in every month. So uh, there's a risk of this building not being used. So maybe this is to overdo the uh, ventilation part a little bit on the standard building. And of course by today's standard we want these installations to do what we need them to do and not to define our building, it's obvious. And when we talk about installations, it's a bit of a joke of course, but when we talk about installations, I said at the beginning, you have to understand these installations will take space, if not something what we do, inside the building. How much space it is depends on the type of building. A typical retail shop will have to allocate about 8% of its complete area for installations, while a hotel will have to allocate 17% 
product and for installations. If you allocate more than that, of course, you lose rentable space. If you allocate less than that, either technical installations will become extremely complicated or you cannot serve them or you cannot maintain them, or you will actually have inadequate uh, installations. So these numbers uh, are quite important to know for an architect from the very beginning. Somebody told me yesterday they planned a big, uh, in, in, it was in Tallinn somewhere, was it a, a, a big building where they had even a prize winning uh, concept of a big building where they forgot all the technical rooms. And the building won the, the contest. That's a bit scary. Because I know when the building is built, there will be technical rooms on the cost of the architecture and somewhere, right? So, and then we go for an example with strong architecture and strong HVAC. And Petro already said at the beginning, it's actually there's a whole case study on this building in the Air Academy, so you can visit the homepage. And that's the Osla Oslo Opera House. I think it's a very, very good example of how to do everything right from the very beginning again. Now, here you have a beautiful building, at least most people think so, with perfect <coughs> indoor climate. You are flexible, you have uh, nothing that disturbs you anywhere, and you have, of course, it's very representative, and it's low running cost, and it's extremely attractive, and it actually lifts all of Oslo. And long term, of course, uh, you are, you're flexible, you have a healthy building for many, many years. So just to give you some examples on this, um, you have the correct facade in glass type. Uh, you, have, you keep the cold windows outside, you get some of the advantage from the solar in the summer. You have the perfect indoor climate, being really silent. Imagine you listen to this beautiful classical music. You can't hear the ventilation like here. It's impossible because there should be a pianissimo somewhere, right? And then you shouldn't hear anything, almost, you know? And of course, you have a lot of spaces in, this, uh, in there as well, where there's a lot of change of views, like these ballet rooms that was talked about. Sometimes a lot of people and performances, and sometimes it's just the dancers uh, practicing during game time. So you have to adapt to that climate-wise. And of course, there's features like solar panels. Of course, there are features with intelligent facades, with intelligent solar shading that goes up and down, very high glass quality, all of that thought after from the very beginning. I think that's a really good example how to create such a net zero energy building or near zero energy building. And just as an example, what they did is they integrated the supply air in the auditorium under the chairs. So very low, low uh, air volume air trickles out under the seats. And because it's exactly where you're sitting, the cold air comes out here, it, it will actually cool you and not all the rest, first of all. So the, the cooling need is supplied exactly where you are as a heat source. And by that you can use far less air, you don't produce the noise. It's 17 decibel that I've measured there. 17 decibel, you wouldn't, I mean, you, you'd have to stop breathing if finding out what 17 de decibels is. It's, if you won't hear it, it's silent. So that's quite nice. Now comes a really hard question. Which of these air handling units do you think needs less energy? Please, what are you saying? Which of these air handling units will use less energy? What do you think? Anyone else? The one on the left. Come on. <laughs> which, one uses le which one uses less energy? What do you think? The right one. The right one? Right. I thought so too. Maybe it had something to do with that company, but unfortunately, no. It's this one. It uses less energy. Do you know why? It's broken. <laughs> And that's the whole thing. If we don't ventilate, of course it's cheaper. Yeah, we're going to zero energy building, basically. But what else do we get? We get an airtight house. I mean, again, get this guy who's counting his mushrooms. We get a lot of problems if we don't ventilate. So if we don't do that to spend money. We do that because it's necessity to live and to have the right comfort. And sometimes this is also in Sweden the same discussion. How I many if we want to save energy, we just lower the ventilation rates. To the cost of what? If we look at Brian and Leed, some of them will only look at the energy efficiency and the energy you spend, and some of them will not look at what's the indoor air quality. That's quite terrible, because what's the point of building buildings otherwise if we don't want to be in them? But I put down for you some rule of thumbs. Again, these slides you will get on the presentations. You don't have to write anything down. 
These are a mixture of partly legal, partly experienced, partly standards that are used pretty much worldwide of what the building actually needs to feel well. So you might find some of these numbers are higher or lower than what you're used to, quite often higher. But if you, if you uh, respect these numbers, you will find that you will get the building that's performing the way you like it to perform. So on retail, you will see the ventilation rates, for instance, are different than on schools. So you, you see the classroom and you see the, uh, the, the 1.2 liters per second and you see the, uh, the 300 liters for the whole classroom. The sound levels are roughly the same in a school and a retail. They're much higher than in hotels or offices, of course, because there's so much sound level anyway in a school or in a retail facility. On the one hand, you normally acclimatize with air, and here is normally with water, because the schools will be normally the radiators that you typically have, water radiators. Temperatures are pretty much the same, a little bit uh, more stringent in uh, retail than in schools. And what you have to imagine also in uh, in schools, you normally don't have chillers. You will only have free cooling. Or you should have free cooling, because in many schools where you could have free cooling, you actually are reducing the ventilation numbers due to some fantastic passive house standard. And the, build, the room is overheating, while the air would actually be available for, uh, to, heat, to cool the room for free. So the, the whole passive house idea to always, to any cost, have as little air as possible moving into the building. It's not really true when you look at the thermal part of it. It's the same thing if you want to supply air and heat in a passive house, you should not have more than you need for, uh, for the people to breathe, which means that you have to put in up to 55 degrees of air into a passive house to heat. What do you think happens to that air? Oop, up to the ceiling. Are you living up in the ceiling? I don't. I live down here. So I don't like the fresh air coming up there. I want it to, to be where I breathe. You know? So it's important. To, to know these things. And here again, in retail you have the 8% you will need, and school you need a little bit more. You need 12% of the space for the installations to work perfectly. If we take the same example, no, so one more here is uh, you calculate the square meter per, per, per person. Here you have the 8 plus 4 square meter per person, so 8 normally will be uh, 8 plus 4, including all the shelves and all the, the furniture in the shop, and 8 is the free space. And in the school, it's two and a half square meters per person, plus all the other rooms. This is only the classroom, and then you have everything around the classroom, of course. If we go for hotel and offices, well, the required in a hotel is 80 cubic meters per hour, or 22 liters per second. It's more or less the same like one air change per hour, which is important to have the right air quality in a hotel room. While in an office, it's about half of that, to get the right indoor plant. Sound level, you see, is quite a big difference. Hotel should be below 25 decibel because you sleep there. Office can be 32 because hopefully you don't sleep there. So that's the difference in activity you have, which is important. And of course, climatization is uh, could be air with air or water in the office, and normally it's done by water in hotels. And the reason for that is, of course, every room has a different requirement in a hotel. Somebody really wants to have it very warm in his room. Next door, they want to have it quite cool in the room. Depends what you're used to, maybe from home or how you're tempered anyway. <laughs> Temperature requirements are a bit more stringent in hotel because you're lying still in your bed, so you cannot afford to have any draft or being too cold or too warm. And of course, in hotels, it's very advisable to have the demand control on all the levels, including the air. In offices, you normally only see the demand control temperature. There's a good argument for demand control volume in offices as well, but you normally don't see that. And hotels, that's the big kicker, 17% space for technical installations. If you don't have that, I'll give you one example. Hotels, we said, should be silent, right? Where do you think are the risers, the ducts that go up and down in hotels? Well, they're in the bathroom normally, right? The bathroom is very close to where you sleep. The bed is next door. What happens, do you think, if those risers become too small? Part of the 70%. Now I give you 10%. Okay, I make the risers smaller, I make the air ducts smaller. What happens with the air ducts a bit smaller? Same air volume, air speed goes up. What more goes up? Sound level goes up. What more goes up? Pressure goes up. SFP goes up. Energy cost goes up. So it will cost you, cost you, cost you more and more. And on top of that, the hotel gets comes back 
sorry, it's noisy in my room. I don't want to pay for my room. I go to another hotel next time. So it will cost you many times to not accept those 70% in a hotel. In offices, it's about 10%. And normally, it's a vertical system where you go through the ceilings. So it's less, a bit more easy. And of course, here in a hotel, you have the hotel room, 20 square meters plus 10 square meters for all the other areas around. And in offices, you have normally the 10 plus 5 per square meter for each and every workplace. 10 square meters around your own workstation, and then 5 square meters for all the others, like the, the coffee lounge or yeah. corridors and so on. <laughs> so, indoor climate matters, of course. When indoor climate is draft, humidity, sound level, temperature, all of these parts are really important to be comfortable. And it is important, sometimes we put energy before quality. I believe it's important to say, this is the quality we want in this building, in this school, in this office, in this retail facility, in this home. And this is the quality we want, no matter what. And now when we have established that quality, like Marini said, certain functions have to happen. Then we can discuss how we can reduce the energy without reducing the comfort, without reducing those parts. That's interesting. So that's why, of course, the energy part and efficiency is number two, but not number one. And here we can call it whatever you like, but it's all has the same, the same idea of all these functions, of all these methods, is to reduce the, uh, the purchased energy, the, the, the delivered energy to the building, to be more environmentally friendly. When we talk about these energies, of course, we have to know a lot of things that we said before. What sources are available? I mean, it's great to talk about um, uh, district heating in the Swedish countryside, but there is no district heating because there's houses in the forest. You don't get district heating there. Uh, it's great to talk about gas, but we don't have gas. If you go to the UK, there's gas everywhere. So we have to know what is available. Of course, oil we want to uh, don't use at all anymore. And uh, what's the price for different energy sources? Well, any of you in this room probably are in a position where you want to look at different solutions and how quickly they pay back. And I find it quite interesting, no matter if I talk to this audience or to salesmen of producers or to professors or to whatever, how often, I think 80% of you might actually know what are the current energy prices in Estonia. So I put them there for you. Because if you don't know these energy prices, you cannot value what will it cost you to use gas or electricity or district heating? You cannot put any monetary value to it. Yes, we can talk kilowatt hours as much as we want, but at the end of the day, there's some investor paying for what you are designing, what you are building. And if you can't show, show me the money. How much money will this cost me per year? How much money will I save per year? They don't care about kilowatt hours. I can't touch kilowatt hours, but I can say, I can say I, I save 40,000 euros. Well, that, that rings a bell. I can say 2 million kilowatt hours. It sounds less good than 40,000 euros, strangely, because it actually could be more. But it's just kilowatts. So you actually want to be able to compare things on the monetary side. And that's, this is, everybody should know these numbers for their own market. And if you, if you have some project somewhere in body which is different prices, you should know those prices. No problem. Of course, you have to think about monopoly <laughs> and price stability. If a huge area in Stockholm that was just redone, and then the only gas provider that is there because everything was hooked up with gas, hired the gas price of 35%. Tough luck, you have to buy from me. I'm the only one. Is that nice? I don't think so. And of course, you have the legislation. I think it was talked about that in Sweden we vet electricity differently than in Estonia, than in, in Holland. Of course, you have to think, what is the legislation telling you what is preferably to use. Another part is really interesting. A lot of buildings have simultaneous need of heating and cooling. Think of an office block. Typically one facade to the south, one to the north. So in spring and autumn, what's happening? You have a cooling need in the south, you have a heating need in the north. Typically what's happening? You buy district heating to heat the north, and you have a chiller running to cool the south, right? You've seen that before somewhere? Doesn't exist in Estonia, right? You all do it differently. No, what you're actually doing, you, you, you're buying 100 kilowatts of heat from the district heating, you put it onto the north side, then you buy 100 kilowatts of cooling for the south facade, 
producing actually 130 watt of heating in excess energy by producing cooling, and that you throw out of the building. And you're comfortable with that. You're crazy. Right? And you're not very sustainable. I mean, one thing would be, as soon as there is simultaneous need, of course you don't use the district heating, you use the excess energy from the, from the chiller to heat the north side, because that energy is more than enough. And that situation actually is true for all the te outdoor temperatures, temperatures between 5 and 15 degrees, where the outdoor temperature is somewhere between 5 and 15, you will normally have a simultaneous need in the building for heating and cooling somewhere. And if you look in Tallinn, this amount of hours per year is almost half the hours per year are between 5 and 15, if you look at the whole 24, whole 8,400 hours, 700 hours. That's quite interesting. So it's much more than what you think. And of course, then you have to compare also how efficient are your producers, ER, COP, and so on and so forth, to make your choice. And then in the end, what we talked about, of course, the carbon footprint. How much CO2 do we produce, emit? And are we in control of that process? We again come back to this demand control all the time, on all levels. Absence, presence control. How many people are we here? How are we using this space? And what also was said before, that's the whole idea with this week on Air Academy as well, is to say that we want people to have a raised knowledge of things. Because if you understand how things work, this will benefit all of us. Not only certain groups, not only certain suppliers, not only certain end users. We all have the, no we have the knowledge, we can use the technology in hand we have and to make buildings of a better quality, higher comfort and lower energy use. I want to give you some case studies, because I have some time left, right? Ten minutes, perfect. Case studies. Show me the money we talk about. Um, little, 5,000 of these shops all around Europe. This is one in Gothenburg. We made a study for them. The standard retail uh, system normally is a CAV system. You supply constant air volume to shops. It's still 80% of all shops in Europe operate on constant air volume. And we told them, okay, what do we do if we put a demand control system there? Fully demand controlled. On air quality, on temperature, on humidity. This is the annual fan power they actually have measured in the building. And this is another building we built, the one in Gothenburg, where we measured these numbers. So what you see, the fan power of course went down to a quarter. What you see, the heating went down almost half, and the cooling went down a little bit, not too much. In money, translated into money, this actually means a saving of about 6,000 euros per year per shop. Well, you have quite a few shops, so that's quite a lot of money. Good example? When we look at this, that yeah, but of course you build a more expensive system. You have spent much more money to do this. Have I? Let's have a look. Here you have the investment for district heating and you have a water chiller for the heating and cooling. On this side you have no district heating and you have a cost for a reversible heat pump that works on gas. And that costs roughly the same like the water chiller. So right now you actually saved the investment for district heating. And then you have 20% smaller central ducts, you need 20% less air diffusers, and 20% smaller air handling units on the right side because of the demand control ventilation. Do you really still think that this is more expensive than this? So actually they save investment and they save energy cost during the year. And they could even say, yes, we're green. So that gives you a good lobby. But that's not why they did it. The last 60 shops have been built like this. And it's just because of the money. They didn't even care about the word environment. If I would go there and talk about environment, they just kick me out. Because it sounds expensive. They didn't understand that environment is friendly was cheaper. Now, this they understood because I showed them the money. So we're starting to doubt a little bit about these numbers here. Those dots. I give you... Um, one more example, integrated design, just on base of ventilation. Here we have an air handling unit with a standard rotor and without cool recovery. Now this is an example of roll, warm and humid. And then we use an air handling unit with cool recovery or with absorption rotor. You know what absorption rotor is? Where you recover the humidity, like hygroscopic rotor before. Absorption is slightly better. Because you can even recover the humidity that is not in driplet form. 
So, standard situation was 404 kilowatt installed cooling power. On a CAV system, this would be over 200 megawatt hours per year. Just by going to DCV system, this is going down to uh, not one third, but at least quite a bit or under 100 megawatt hours per year. Just for changing from constant air volume to demand controlled air volume. Now we're going with cool recovery. Actually, you only need to install 286 kilowatts of cooling in order to, because you use the cool recovery, the colder return air coming back to pre cool the outdoor air. And of course, on the CAV and DCV, you also save some more money going down. Now we even recover the humidity, which of course is more interesting in a humid place than in a dry place. And what do you think happens? It drops below 200. And of course, the annual goes down to 61 megawatt on the DCV or 150, which is quite a bit less than 237 on the constant air volume. Which means only on investment on the chiller, they save 25,000 euros for the chiller. And I think a sorption rotor or hygroscopic rotor cost a couple of hundred euros. Still, most of the buildings are built with a standard rotor. Now, that's why knowledge is so important. You don't want to spend 2,000 euros to save 25,000 euros. Well, everybody who understands that will say spend 2,000 euros, right? Because payback time is within a couple of weeks. It's ridiculous. And no matter if you go for CAV or DCV, you will save between 8,000 and 17,000 euros per year on running costs on top of that. So even here, the integrated design starts very early only within installations and knowledge. Two hotel examples I want to finish off with. One of them is on uh, Victoria Tower in uh, Stockholm. They had to choose if they should go for a DCV or a CAV system. And we tried to show them the rule of thumb. You will spend 10% more investment for a more complicated system. It is only on the HVAC system. But you will save, save about 35% of energy per year. And there's this calculation we've done over and over again in all the different countries, and it's always very close to those numbers. So the second thing you should take away from home today, if you go for a high quality demand control system, investment goes up by 10%, in worst case, in schools, I can even put it down to zero. And you will roughly save 35% of energy per year. So that gives you quite a good payback time. Now Victoria Tower, they told me how they calculate LCC. And this was completely different than what I do. Because I say, no, 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 we, the payback time that we look at, of course, is the money that we put on the table for this building. So, okay, how much money do you put on the table? 20% of the total investment. The rest of the 80% we finance by the bank. Now, that's interesting. So, if I look for your 20%, what happens? If you look at Victoria Tower, they had to invest 238,000 euros extra for the DCB. 20% was investment, 80% was finance, so that, that cost them 47,000 euros extra. Which meant for the first two, after the first two years, the energy saving paid for the money that came out of their pocket. And from on year three, they're now on year four or five, they're actually uh, uh, getting 47,000 euros more in money into their pockets. And with a bank loan of, I don't know, one and a half percent, that's the money they want to have. So I don't have to calculate the LCC on the whole money. I could calculate it on the 20%. That's quite interesting, I think. So, and that led to another case study. This is the last one for today, which is a real case study in a hotel in, in Scotland, in Glasgow. And this is quite nice because energy cost in, in uh, Scotland is very, very close, both on district heating and electricity, what, what it costs in Estonia. So I didn't change the prices because they are very close to what you would pay here. So this would be highly applicable for an elderly hotel somewhere in, uh, in Estonia. It's quite a run-down place, 180 rooms. Uh, they, they have 28, 24 degrees outside in the summer. It's not too, not too warm in Scotland. And minus 8 in winter. So not too cold in winter either. It's quite moderate climate, right? So they have uh, gas, heat, gas boilers. They have no comfort cooling. And they have an extra system only, taking the extra air from the bathrooms that you will find a lot of old hotels in Europe. And the problem here was, and that's why, why I came in and visited them, they had a lot of problems. They had the high energy bills, it was very expensive to run this hotel. 
the, the, actually the boilers were starting to fail. So they had like five boilers, three of them started to shut, one of them was dead, and two of them was on the brink of shutting down. So they had to do something. And they have an old pipe system. You go into the rooms, you actually hear a lot of things going on in the pipe system that you don't want to hear. And the rooms are getting completely too warm in the summer. They're overheating a lot. So there's a lot of issues. And they ask me, what should I do? Should we buy new, new boilers? But, well, if you do that, great. But all the other problems are still there, right? We don't solve anything of the else. So what they wanted to know, how much money can we spend for renovation that will pay back within one year? Would that be interesting? How much can the renovation cost before we start anything? And so I can get back my money doing my, what I do within one fiscal year. So when I do my books at the end of the year, I'm already done. Would that be okay for you? Okay, let's have a look. Existing extract air system compared to a DCV system, demand control, balanced air volume. Right now, they're using 552 megawatt hours of energy per year for heating. And they need 35 megawatt hours per for the ventilation energy for electrical fan power. On the DCV system, it's almost ridiculous, it goes down, the transmission is exactly the same. We didn't touch the shell. It's quite bad, but we didn't do it because it's too costly. But the air replacement from a complete extract air system goes from 441 to 5.5. It's completely ridiculous. They have so much overheating in the building, they basically don't need any heat ever because it was minus eight in the winter, not very cold. So they could reuse so much of the heat they had everywhere, it almost goes away. And the tap water is the same, we didn't touch. So the hole goes down from 500 um, uh, megawatt hours to 116, so it's about one quarter. Electrical fan power goes down a little bit, but keep in mind, this is only extra, this is extra at supply, demand control. So now you have actually two-way fans, and it's still a little bit less. Now, again, putting this into money, you see that they pay about five euro cent per kilowatt of district of gas, which is not comparable with your district heating in Estonia, right? And the fan power they have here, the total energy cost per year was 33,000 euros. So we went over to a heat pump system and demand control ventilation. And what you see here is the heat pump system based on the electricity costs divided by four, heat pump efficiency of CUP4, <coughs> we go down from 27 to 4,000. It's almost the same, so we go from 33,000 to 9,000 euros per year. It's quite a nice saving, right? Now, tap water. They needed 160 kilowatts today. With this system, they need to install 58 kilowatts. So the installation actually gets cheaper as well on the tap water side. But the tap water itself that you use will be the same. So the total energy cost per year, 33,000 versus 9,200. Now comes something else which is extremely interesting. Remember the rooms were overheating, remember? Remember there was a lot of problems with the climate. So they had no comfort cooling here. Now they have comfort cooling. And a lot of it is free cooling, and a lot of it actually is the excess energy they have from all the showers of the swimming pool. So they use that. You need to have the heating anyway, so the cooling, one of them goes for free, right? The average room rate in Glasgow, just off the center, was 50 euros per night, which is not too impressive. This is a little bit like Tallinn. It's not too much, huh? How much more do you think they can take per night when they have comfort cooling, no overheating, no more sound level? What do you think? Give me an estimation. 120 euros? Wow, okay. Anybody else? 80. 80 euros. Anything else? The customer told me, well, I would be comfortable with uh, 70, 75. Is that okay? I made a calculation for you where I raised the room rate with 5 euros per night. Do you think that's too much? Obviously not, because you just told me the numbers. Is 5 euros okay for you? So I, I only take 5 euros more per night, okay? The other part is the occupancy rate. This hotel near Glasgow is 70% occupied. So 30% of the time the hotel rooms are empty. Probably also to customers that are unsatisfied and are not coming back because they didn't like the hotel last time. What do you think happens to the occupancy right now? This hotel is in good climate condition. <laughs> Any idea? Occupancy rates? 100? Oh, oh, right. 90%? 80. 
uh, 80, the customer was guessing 80. I said, okay, again, let's be conservative. Is it okay for you? I counted with 75%. Okay? Are you happy with this? And now this is interesting, guys and girls. If we're talking about net zero energy buildings, to sell this to part somebody, like an investor, you only talk about energy, energy saving. And the energy saving is so fantastic, it saves you 24,000 euros per year. That's great. Now, what you think is five euros per night more and 5% more on occupancy rate. Because that's the value of indoor climate that you cannot put the value on, you said before. I put the value on indoor climate now. Now, what do you think is the worth of that per year? 180 rooms. It's a 410,000 euros extra per year. 410,000. It's 20 times more almost like the energy saving. Now, that's why I argue. Are you sure that this is going to be like this, or is this one actually moving there? Are you sure that the extra perfect indoor climate costs you money? Or are you actually increasing your profit? And that's much more interesting than the energy saving. Now, what happens if these dots move over here? We don't need the legislation anymore. You want to do it out of pure egoistic money saving, profit, profit increasing, hunger, greed, whatever. And what you do? You're sustainable. You save energy. It's great. I think, that's the, I think that is the idea forward. So they had the 434,000 euros extra capital per year. Again, with 20% own capital and 80% investment, that gave them a two, over 2.1 million, 2.2 million euros of money they could use for the refurbishment of the hotel. Uh, I, I dropped out of the project, I got in the first two quotes. One was, I think, 1.9 million, one was 2.05 million. So both quotes they had received were below for the whole job. Taking the whole stuff down, putting new stuff in, the quotes were below what they would be getting in an extra revenue and at the end of the fiscal year, they would be in the green. Like nothing ever happened. And suddenly you have a hotel in Glasgow where people actually want to live. You like this? I hope you can take this with you somewhere and use it for something. So, integrated design with an HVAC. You have the motor. It has to work together. Air production, cooling, and heating production. You need to talk of the logistics. Dampers, silences, valves. Diffusion in the room, demand control, drills, beams, comfort modules. And all of this have to be by control, demand control, and optimized. And then on the other hand, you have to have the, the, the demands on the logistics, the pipes, the ductwork. If all of this works together, you have an integrated design on the edge. <laughs> if, you, if you then work together with the architect from the beginning, you have an integrated design for the whole building. And what you get in the end is, Rental income, you have your cost, you have your profit, and you want to earn more. And you, how you do that? You do that by looking at the investment, looking at the maintenance, the energy, and the profit. And as I said before, you spend 10% more on the investment, and you will save roughly 35% of energy per year. And this is how you pay for it. And on top of that, you have the higher comfort for the people, and you save polar bears. That would be quite nice, right? So, last picture. Integration of concept, location, aesthetics, and technical design. That's what integrated solutions should be about. Early integration of architects and HVAC concepts. Be there from day one. Early location of installation space and definition of indoor climate. What, are the, what is the indoor climate you want to have to get maximum out of it? And where should those 18%, 10%, 12% be located in the building? Fix that as early as possible. And of course, the technical design should fit to the architecture. And by that, it actually becomes invisible. You integrate that into the architecture. And the perfect indoor climate, as we said before, if it's perfect, it becomes invisible as well. So all of us will be happy and comfort. And of course, in the end, we have maximized the comfort but we have minimized the environmental impact. That's what we talked about today, uh, near zero energy buildings, which is much easier to say than in Estonia, it's null or something, right? So, near <laughs> nullo. So, I hope I could do some contribution with that. Thank you for being.